<laughs> Edward, you really think there's nothing to it? Gardner, in my opinion, the telephone will never be anything more than a toy. You won't put any of your money into it or advise your friends to do so? I shall urge all my friends they have nothing to do with it. And I suppose the next thing, you'll be wanting us to wire every house and public building in the country? We might have to do that too, eventually. Mr. Bell, tomorrow morning, Sanders and I are going to have our heads examined just for standing here listening to such nonsense. Mission sequence starts. Two, one. There's no avoiding it. The technological age is upon us. Technological influences are everywhere. Making our lives more efficient and everyday tasks that much easier. Everything from the supermarket checkout to the most complex scientific analysis. Without these technological crutches, we become almost paralyzed, forgetting how to perform the most basic functions. Ensuring that these technological advances continue is a priority. Computer companies need incentives to invest in research and development. Users want the best product and compatibility among computer software. Unfortunately, these two worthwhile objectives often come clashing head to head. Lotus versus Borland is at the heart of this debate. The narrow issue of Lotus v. Borland boils down to the copyrightability of a computer menu command hierarchy. Is it like the buttons of a VCR serving a purely functional purpose? Or is it more like a short story, an original expression capable of being told in an infinite number of ways? Even more fundamentally, the question is, to what elements of a computer are we willing to extend copyright law? The United States Constitution states, Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for a limited time authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. By giving creators an assured economic return for their expressive works, copyright protection fosters the growth of learning and culture for the benefit of the public. Books, plays, and music are bountiful and enrich us both intellectually and spiritually. Copyright law, however, was not written with a computer in mind. The computer didn't seem to fit into the existing copyright framework. Congress empowered CONTU, the Commission on New Technological Use of Copyrighted Works, to explore the applicability of copyright to computers. The theory of it is you don't run before you walk. Uh, you don't try to legislate, let alone dump a system of law that has served as well for a couple of centuries uh, simply because a new phenomenon emerges on the horizon. Uh, you, you try and use the common law process, the judicial process, to walk, to take baby steps. And when you've gotten enough baby steps so that you feel fairly stable, uh, then you can begin to define the doctrine in a way that, that makes sense and gives the kind of stability that people want. Contu's opinion basically extended copyright protection to the literal elements of the computer, source code and object code. What remained to be addressed was the extent to which copyright law should be applied to non-literal elements of a computer, such as the user interface. Section 102A of the Copyright Act extends copyright protection to original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression, such as musical works, literary works, pantomimes and choreographic works, pictorial graphic, sculptural, and architectural works. Section 102B of the Copyright Act excludes from copyright protection any idea, procedure, process, or method of operation. The user interface is how one executes a computer program. Since copyright does not extend to functional creations under 102B, arguably this would mean that computer interfaces are not deserving of any copyright protection. How do we balance the, the, the fact that 
uh, we have uh, expressive elements in the utilitarian objects, such as a software program. This is not a novel. It's not a poem. It's not a play, which is is purely fanciful. And the courts have struggled with trying to draw a line between uh, expression and and non-protectable elements. The Lotus v. Borland saga began in 1990, when Lotus Development sued Borland International for copyright infringement seeking $100 million in damages. Lotus publishes the Lotus 123 electronic spreadsheet program. Users manipulate and control the program by choosing from a series of menu commands, such as copy, print, and quit, located in a two-line menu at the top of the computer screen. Users can also set up their own customized macros by programming a series of menu commands that are executed with a single keystroke. Borland developed its own spreadsheet programs called Quattro and Quattro Pro. These programs achieved compatibility with Lotus 123 by offering users an alternate user interface, the Lotus Emulation Interface. This allowed Lotus Spreadsheet users to switch to the Borland program without having to learn new commands. Lotus users could also run their macros in Quattro by using the key reader, which emulated Lotus interfaces, enabling the program to understand and perform some of Lotus 123 macros. Believing that this was a blatant violation of its protected rights, Lotus sued Borland for copyright infringement. In the trial court, Judge Keaton of Massachusetts granted summary judgment for Lotus, holding that the menu command of its Lotus 123 program is copyrightable and was infringed by Quattro's 123 mode. By filtering out the unprotectable procedures, processes, systems, and methods of operation, Judge Keaton determined that the parts of Lotus's system that were capable of separate expressive elements were deserving of protection. Unfortunately for Lotus, however, this was hardly the end of their battle. The First Circuit reversed Judge Keaton's decision, holding that Lotus's menu command hierarchy was not copyrightable subject matter under Section 102A of the Copyright Act. The court was persuaded by Borland's arguments, expressed in part by a videotape. Lotus is trying to copyright procedures and methods of operation, as Lotus's own video plainly states. Hi, my name is Larry Rochefeld. I'm Lotus's product marketing manager for 123. Lotus's video clearly shows that Borland's product and 123 can perform the same operations using the same procedures, but the products look entirely different. Lotus is not complaining about the way Borland's product looks to the user. Lotus is complaining about the fact that Borland's product can perform the same operations using the same procedures. Now we'll take a look it had to change the default for recalculation from automatic to manual. First in Quattro, using the 123 compatible menus, and then in Lotus 123 release 2.01. First, I press the slash, as you saw, to get up the menu. Then I can press the letter W to choose the worksheet option. Performing some common operations in Quattro Pro. In no case does copyright protection for an original work of authorship extend to any idea, procedure, process, system, or method of operation. Now we'll see how to use the Lotus compatible menus in Quattro to change the default formatting for a series of cells to currency, two decimal places, and perform the same operation in 123 release 2.01. To change the default setting for cells to currency in Quattro, we first access the menu by pressing slash. In 123, to perform the same operation, we again access the menu and performing the same operations, and then do the same operation, perform the same operation, perform the same operation, and perform the same operation, the exact same process, and do the same operation, same series of operations, the same operation, same procedure, and same series of operations, the same operation, and the same operation, the same operation, the same procedure, and that same operation, same operation, and same operation, the same operation, the same operation. This concludes our presentation. The First Circuit compared a menu structure to the buttons on a VCR, the record, play, rewind. The buttons themselves are the method of operating the VCR. In a concurring opinion, Judge Boudin analogized copywriting a menu command hierarchy to granting a copyright for the QWERTY keyboard. 
This would have some of the consequences of patent protection. It would be like making all typists captive to anyone who had a monopoly on the production of a QWERTY keyboard. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, this is a copyright infringement case. It was brought and tried under the Copyright Act and none other. Now, the First Circuit committed a fundamental error here when it held that Section 102B of the Copyright Act precludes, as a matter of law, protection for the separable original expression found in the menus of Lotus 123. You believe the sole question before this court at this time is whether the First Circuit is accurate in its construction of the relationship between 102A and 102B? I believe that is precisely the question on which this court granted certiorari and that that is properly the only question before this court. I think the language, the choice of the word subsist in 102A and extend in 102B strongly suggests that the interpretation that we've argued for is the correct one, namely copyright subsists, but then there is a limitation on the effective scope of protection. The First Circuit took a definitional shortcut, which was fundamentally flawed. What the First Circuit did was it said, we can look at this and say, this is a method of operation, or it's part of a method of operation. Therefore, it is per se precluded, and we need not examine further. Need not examine further. The fact that there is original separable expression here, which is exactly what Judge Keaton found after trial, isn't a factor. The First Circuit did not consider that relevant. Our position has never been that we own any particular command, any particular word, any more than one would look at any other literary work uh, and say, I own that word. It's the collection of words in a particular order and arrangement that provides copyrightable subject matter. To the extent that, that you are attempting indirectly or directly to be obtaining a copyright over the order of those functions, I would say that that's an unprotectable system or method. If the words appear on the printed page, there's no question they're protected. The code within the program, which is unintelligible to most people and never seen by the user and has nothing to do with the program as far as the user is concerned, is protectable. But the words, when they appear on the screen and speak to the user, according to Borland and according to the First Circuit, that per se, as a matter of law, can't be protected. And we don't believe that that can be reconciled with congressional intent. I would take issue with uh, Mr. Hutton when he said that no one would dispute this command hierarchy if printed on a page would be copyrightable. In fact, we do dispute that. And I would, would suggest that all the hundreds of books that have been written explaining 1, 2, 3, that in the course of them contain the 469 words and explain what functions uh, they provide, did not infringe any any of this copyright. On January 16th, one week following oral argument in the case, the Supreme Court issued a procurium opinion stating only that the judgment of the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit is affirmed by an equally divided court. Justice Stevens took no part in the decision, and as a result, this legal precedent is only binding upon the First Circuit. Everybody was disappointed, everybody was surprised um, that the court, you know, not only that it, that it deadlocked in the case, but that it deadlocked so soon after oral argument. It was less than two weeks after oral argument. It's surprising that that the two sides, that, the, that Justice Rehnquist didn't suggest that the two sides draft uh, competing opinions to try to persuade each other. Uh, it seems as if the Supreme Court gave up without a fight. Uh, I think the mission of the courts here was to interpret the statute as Congress wrote it and as Congress intended. And uh, I think my disappointment was that uh, much of the argumentation, the written argumentation, uh, uh, in both the First Circuit and before the Supreme Court was addressed to policy issues uh, that were not properly before the court uh, and that were based also on, on, on a factual record that had never been developed. Everybody's hopes have been built up to, you know, okay, we'll get the law of the land finally. You know, whatever it is, we'll know what it is. And now, uh, it's kind of... Um, a vacuum. So Lotus won in the appellate court. 
Borland one. Borland one in the appellate court. Right. I got you. And then we'll, and the final determination was what? It was very surprising. Uh, I was very surprised. I think the First Circuit opinion was overly simplistic. They didn't deal with or grapple with the issue in any intelligent or intellectual way. They, rather than try to uh, untangle the Gordian knot that they were presented with, which Judge Keaton had st at least made a sincere attempt to struggle with responsibly, uh, they said, we're just going to go around the Gordian knot. We're going to ignore it altogether. Probably the First Circuit did the right thing. Whether it was for the right reason or not is, is something there's great disagreement on. And to the extent that we need clarification in this statute, we're not going to get it as a result of this case. Well, I think the law is more settled. I, I read a little bit more into the Supreme Court's decision uh, than merely a tie vote. I think they had two options uh, when they got back. Uh, I guess they had three options. They could have declared one side or other the winner. Um, I think it was clear to them that it was a complicated case, and they, some of them at least didn't really have it under control. So they could have... Um, just declared that cert was improvidently granted, in which case that would have left the First Circuit decision intact, or they could have affirmed it by a divided vote, which they did, meaning they affirmed the case, but as you pointed out, it only has effect in the First Circuit. That's what they chose to do. The general trend in the law is against protection, and with the Supreme Court case as backdrop, my guess is we've seen the last menu case we're ever going to see. I'm happy that it came out that way because I've been a very strong argument that to the extent stronger protection is needed, copyright is the wrong way to do it. And so therefore, this avoided setting a very dangerous precedent, one that would backfire, one that would actually wind up reducing the amount of innovation and hurting users. So I'm happy it came out that way. I wish it had come out more strongly. I think the main concern was let's focus on the law. And under the law, it should not have been uh, that difficult a case, has always been my view. Was this a difficult case? How did the courts come to their decisions? What were the important issues they took into consideration, and how accurate were their conclusions? The amount of effort that goes into the user interface is broken down into many pieces. One is the layout of the commands. Another one is the choice of functions and how those functions work. Uh, in 1, 2, 3, there are a lot of decisions like uh, when there is a, um, uh, a column where there's text that's too wide for the column. What happens to that? If Does it go into the next column? Yes, they make it go into the next column. What happens if you scroll so the beginning is off the screen? Do we show the little piece or don't we? That, that's a pro big problem in programming about whether you do that. Those are decisions that have to be made. The way we did the design was that before we ever got to the issue of the uh, specific names for items on the menus or the arrangements of the menus, you know, which ones called other ones, we worked at a more general level, for instance, of what kind of functionality did we want to have in the graphing program or what kind of different functionality did we need in, in, in the spreadsheet. Once we had an idea of what kind of functionality, you know, particular features we wanted, it should do this and it should do that and it should not do that, then that, tend, that drove the, um, uh, the design of the user interface itself, the particular command sequences to invoke the functions. We looked carefully at all of the existing spreadsheets. Uh, notably VisiCalc, but not just VisiCalc, also Multiplan and SuperCalc and Context MBA, uh, to see what we thought worked well in them and what didn't work well. And we had a set of ideas about extensions to basic spreadsheet capability that were um, fundamental to the design of 123. In other words, an important part right from the outset was that this thing was going to do things differently and better. So it was going to have macros, it was going to be have more memory capacity, it was going to be faster, it was going to integrate graphing. And there are actually some other ideas that we had that we tried that we had to give up, like having an integrated word processor. Uh, but still in all for the, and the spreadsheet functionality itself, we were clear, was going to extend both in capability and user interface. The functionality 
and the menus were developed in an iterative process. And in fact, the authors of Lotus 1, 2, 3 sat down and created these menus as a series of self-conscious creative acts. They made, they made hundreds and hundreds of choices. They went through dozens and dozens of iterations. Developing a program that's compatible with an existing program is normal practice in software and for a very good reason. If there are a bunch of users who have already learned a particular language for talking to the computer and you want to make a program that those people can use, naturally you want to make it speak the language they already know. You, you want to make it have the same commands, display the output in a similar format so that it will make sense to the people who know how to use the other program. Compatibility is itself such an open-ended term that it doesn't provide any kind of line. It doesn't suggest a, a demarcation point between uh, permissible behavior and, and outright theft. And if you were to go back and review the litigation, both in this case and in the earlier cases Lotus brought and in all of the other cases that have been brought involving software copyright, every scoundrel, even the most outright thief, will claim that he, she, or it did it in the name of compatibility. I think if I'm, if from a software implementation point of view, the interoperability is extremely important. Um, if I'm trying to develop the next important spreadsheet or word processor or even a new system that I want people to be able to incorporate old data into, if I can't read file formats that somebody else has written, if I am not able to convert their little scripts or macros or programs into my new system, that seriously hampers me because there is such a, a base of files of information that people have now that it's very hard, difficult to sell a, a new program and get people to switch to your program if they can't carry any of their legacy stuff with them. Since all, virtually all software is New software is created in this incremental fashion where you borrow lots of things from lots of different programs, just the way I was describing to you. If you interfere with that, if you make it too difficult to create a next generation product, you're really um, hurting everybody, hurting people in the industry who want to do that and hurting, hurting the user community. See, it's, if it were the case that the way software worked is you had the occasional great work and everything else was just like nonsense and trivial, this argument would apply. But our view of, of the way software actually works is that each new product is like reuses elements very heavily that appear in other products and adds a few original things. But what's really of value is the gestalt, is the, is the totality of the arrangement of the elements. Everybody builds on everybody else. It's too complex to make everything different. It's hard enough to do that. So that's one thing that you're going to see in programs. People are always building on the shoulders of giants. If I look at VisiCalc, I can tell you where what program inspired me to do what feature. Don't you think Beethoven stood on the shoulders of Mozart? Uh, don't you think that Shakespeare stood on the shoulders of the Italian writers when he put Romeo and Juliet together? Don't you think that the 20th century uh, dramatists stood on Shakespeare's shoulder when they came up with Abe's Irish Rose and the Coens and the Kellys? There's nothing unique about it. Maybe the shoulders are uh, different shoulders. They're technological sh shoulders as opposed to musical shoulders or art shoulders or, or uh, literary shoulders. Uh, I find this whole argument so stupid to be beyond belief. People are constantly building on top of something, right? And it, it makes me feel great if somebody's able to take my code and do something with it and leverage it into something else. These menus are part of the language for communication between the user and the program, just as the meanings of keys are part of it. So. Uh, <clears throat> Lotus was trying to own, therefore, at least enough aspects of this language that nobody else could implement a spreadsheet that would talk this language with the user. So whether they were trying to own every single aspect of the language or only half of them, you know, a certain half, either way it's enough 
that in practice they have a monopoly on speaking that language with the user. Most programs are going to be very similar in many respects and have to borrow functionality from many other programs because if they're going to save files, they're all going to want to save files in sort of similar ways. There's no reason to, um, to reinvent, to make it different for the sake of being different and for the sake of usability in general, not specifically targeted to one program, but usability in general, you like things to be similar the same way that you like steering wheels. If you turn to the right, they all turn to the right, you know, and the clutch and all that type of stuff. If you're a law firm and you're used to running like WordPerfect 5.1 for DOS and your entire law firm runs on that, even going to the new version of WordPerfect, which is under Windows, is can be a traumatic experience for your users and you don't want to cause them to go through that. The QWERTY keyboard layout was the de facto standard and it's so much work to switch that very few people do. New typists learn the QWERTY layout because they know that's what they're going to find in every office in this country. And offices buy typewriters and computers with QWERTY keyboards because they know that's what everybody knows how to use. The cycle perpetuates itself and it's very hard to switch to the superior interface. The way we actually make progress in keyboard layouts and other such interfaces is through incremental changes. For example, this keyboard has a control key. It has an alt key. It has an escape key. It has a backspace key, which does deletion. It has function keys and arrow keys. Well, those are several different incremental improvements that were initially made by different projects, but each one of them caught on and has spread, and now you'd almost never find a computer keyboard that doesn't have all of them. So this shows that while a total redesign, a totally different interface, is too big an incompatibility for the users to accept, Incremental changes can be accepted because they allow the user to go from this level of function to this level by learning this much instead of by starting from scratch and learning this much. You know, learning this much is worth it, learning this much is not. The QWERTY keyboard is an interesting illustration and it has power. I don't deny that. But you see the alleged lock in factor uh, working both ways. Uh, the fact that I'm dreaming of a white Christmas is the standard for Christmas songs has not prevented access to the Christmas song market. People get used to other things. I mean, interoperability is important to users in general. It's kind of a market requirement. To, to force users to abandon their investment if they've made a lot of models or have documents in a particular format, you know, they need to be able to protect the investment. And if you can't come in with a competing product in a way that, if a competing product is required by law to disrespect people's investment in the first product, that's a huge competitive disadvantage. And I think that that's, as a matter of policy, it's important not to have laws that preclude interoperability. I think it would be a major mistake to assume that you must take these decisions away from the property owners. They belong to the property owners, and if the property owner decides uh, to enforce intellectual property rights rigorously and more rigorously than customers would like, then they pay the price in the marketplace. So, I mean, that, that in itself is a disciplining factor, so you don't have to gut the copyright law. And in instances where competition doesn't work, that's what we have antitrust laws for. So between enforcing antitrust law and the corrective power of the market, where the market's functioning properly, I think you have two very strong protections against people uh, overprotecting or, or, or somehow hurting the world. We have learned the benefit of competition. You know, it keeps the economy healthy. You know, if we lose that at the expense of favoring some rights holder, uh, it gets to the point where, okay, you know, a, a few investors are very happy, but everybody else is suffering. Companies realize uh, that unless they, they make their software non-proprietary at all levels, they're going to lose market share 
to those companies that are using open standards. I think that that, that has been the, the underlying influence that's led to uniformity throughout all areas of, of software development. I believe that it was completely not in Lotus's interest to do what they're doing. That the people who were made the decision to do this lawsuit uh, did not understand the development process. They were viewing themselves that they were trying to protect this one thing they had, one, two, three, they thought was this incredible value, which it was, but only for its time. Um, and were putting their effort into defending from people who weren't really the problem for them when they should have been moving ahead. They were forgetting that in order for them to be where they were, they had to be compatible with what went before, and they had to read the file formats from before, just like most every program reads the file formats of data that comes before, and customers expect that. The U.S. Constitution says the purpose of copyright is to promote progress. It turns out that interface copyright, copyright on a language, can't promote progress. It offers no benefits to small companies. It only gives benefits to those who have a product that's so successful that its language has become the de facto standard, something which you differ from at your peril. And this industry is one uh, whose history shows lots of little startups, uh, a couple of guys working in a garage who have a bright idea, and they show it at a trade show and the world gets excited. Now, if what Borland did is legal, if that were to be the law of the land and were recognized and accepted as such, then what would happen the first time those bright guys showed off their product is that the big companies all around the U.S. and around the world, I mean, uh, Lotus is, in this context, a very small company, was a small company, even before it was acquired by IBM. Uh, would begin the process of reverse engineering and coming out with their own clones of this hot little product. Now, who wins that fight? If there isn't strong intellectual property protection, what happens to the little developer who came up with this product? Today, or at least up till now, with the intellectual property protection in place, if somebody else wanted that product, they had to either enter into a license agreement or, as often happened, buy the company. And there are a lot of these developers who stop working in their garages and drive into those garages with Ferraris precisely because a Lotus or an IBM or a Novell or somebody or Microsoft has liked their product and bought it. If you're talking about a small startup company that's trying to get a niche, there's really two sides to the coin. On the one hand, if you've come up with a really neat idea, you want the protection so that you can at least make back your, your investment off of it and hopefully you know, bankroll and start a company going. The other, the flip side of that is a big company that's got a large portfolio of copyrights and patents that it owns can stomp on you. I'm considered a person who is, is the one that you want to incent to do stuff. What often happens is when a software company gets to a certain size, they bring in a lot of other people and all that. And those people are basically, their goal is to get the next quarter earnings up. And they're worried about short-term type of stuff. And uh, they really can't be speaking on behalf of the industry about all that stuff. Um, because they do have their shareholders. Lotus did have their shareholders short-term views. And they weren't worrying about what they're, are they going to have to clone um, Excel one of these days? They didn't have to worry about that. It runs contrary to the entire intellectual property scheme and, and certainly to the Copyright Act that the notion that the price of popularity is a forfeiture of your rights. I mean what you're saying when you say industry standards lose their protection is we'll let you have copyright protection unless you actually become successful. When you become successful, when you're the most popular, because in software industry standard typically means nothing more profound than that this is, at the moment, the best-selling example of a program in this category. And if what you say is that the best-selling programs lose their protection because they are, quote, standards, and God forbid we should protect standards, uh, you know, imagine 
what the reaction would be if you made such a suggestion for motion pictures or for, or for uh, sound recordings. You know, the Beatles lost their protection because of their popularity or uh, not my cup of tea, but Michael Jackson or somebody like that. You know, you've, you're too popular. Madonna, you're too popular. We're very sorry, you've become the standard. And so now the world is free to copy you. You'd be laughed out of court, you'd be laughed out of a classroom if you made that suggestion with respect to anything else protected by copyright. Star Wars, you now belong to the ages. 20th Century Fox, I'm sorry. I don't think any of the software companies that we've ever backed have had copyright protection. Um, that hasn't been one of the, uh, um, one of the factors that we have um, uh, that we've looked for to, you know, to justify making an investment. If we were financing companies who had an entrenched position, who had a software product with an entrenched position, um, we'd be thinking a lot more about copyrights, as I suspect. If, in fact, it is deemed a method of operation, how is Tele-TV going to distinguish its user interface from Americast, which is going to be its primary telephone-based competitor, or Disney Interactive, which will have an online service of some sort that may be competitive with these services, uh, or TV Guide, which will have its uh, user interface and be offering some sort of online service. And absent the ability to protect that and the distinctive elements of it, uh, why a lot of investment is going to be made with the prospect that it will be taken away. I'm just, I'm angry about it because it's sort of, I love the business and I love designing software and I think overlaying it with this sort of, these sort of motivations, these sorts of behaviors is the sort of thing that drives creative, talented people out of the business. Case in point. Let's face it, the people on the sides of the technology issues are self-interested. Some of them are the creators who want to maximize the reward for their creation, like a Lotus 1, 2, 3. Others are the copyists, and I'm not using copyist in the plagiarism sense. They're the people who earn their keep not by doing original work, the way a Mozart might do an original work, but by standing on the shoulder of other people. Society needs both. Society needs the original software writer. It needs the cloner. Uh, we just haven't struck the balance between the two yet. The lawyers really were approaching the whole subject of software through the eyes of copyright doctrine and not through the eyes of actually understanding what the technology was about or how it worked. So they had a number of assumptions that were just they had a bad map for the territory and didn't even know they had a bad map. The technologists, conversely, understood the territory but really had no legal map at all, no understanding of, of copyright doctrine and its history and where it comes from and why it's there. And when you have that kind of a situation, everything misses the point. There is nothing to suggest that the technology is beyond the compass of smart judges. Uh, they simply have to learn it. That's tough. Some judges are smarter than other judges. But as the world turns and each generation of jurists is replaced by a younger generation of jurists, the gap narrows. Who wins the marketing battle? Uh, the little guy who's got the original produced in his garage versus Fujitsu. Uh, Fujitsu wins every time. So the little guys need the protection more than anybody else. They are the most at risk. The big guys could make the, if, if none of this was proprietary anymore and it was only a matter of, of marketing battle, the big guys could fight that fight. The little guys are gone. So they're the ones who, they may not all understand it, but they're the ones who most needed uh, and need this intellectual property protection. To call, a, call something protection implies that whatever it is blocking is bad and harmful. And therefore, it implies that whenever, that any imaginable kind of intellectual property is a good thing. Therefore, if we want objectively to consider whether a particular kind of intellectual property monopoly harms society or benefits society, 
we should avoid biased words like protection. Developers don't understand the power of Washington and are not well organized. I think that Washington should make more of an effort to understand the needs of developers because, frankly, developers are naive. They don't understand what Washington can do to them. And that, that means that we end up resolving things in court instead of resolving it in Congress, for example. There is a crying need for computer scientists to have better understandings of the law in general, and in particular, intellectual property issues and other issues that evolve because of, of things like the internet. Just like you need, you had lawyers who had to learn about computer science, computer related stuff and network related stuff to be able to deal with those issues. Um, you know, you can have very good attorneys, but if they don't have a background in computer science, you're trying to explain to them what's going on. I mean, you're talking sort of past each other. A lot of software executives in smaller and mid-sized companies are not aware of the law and they do what they're going to do and you know maybe they'll find out down the road what the consequences are but but they're not particularly aware of what the restrictions on them might be our legal system functions so slowly in in a realm where uh, the technology and the economics operate so much faster what we're looking at is sort of an interdisciplinary mismatch scientists love certainty Technology people want to know where every I is dotted and where every T is crossed. That's simply not the way the law operates. The law constantly evolves as it becomes more intelligent on a subject and as it builds experience. And the fact that in the computer software field we've had some ambiguity for a number of years is not a unique phenomenon. Uh, maybe it's a unique phenomenon to computer people, but it is not a unique phenomenon in terms of the law. That's the way we, uh, we operate. When you have lawyers trying to apply copyright doctrine who don't understand the technology, who don't know how to use it, they create sort of, they do things that are fundamentally incoherent, in fact, inconsistent. They say things and don't realize that there are logical entailments of what they say that contradict what they say. And you, again, we have examples of this. I mean, so for instance, um, uh, the, when you look at software purely through the eyes of copyright doctrine, what you miss is the fact that what is valuable about software is the behaviors that the program produces. Because copyright is used to dealing with texts, and texts don't behave. They just sit there on the page or whatever. And so when you reduce software to text and you try to say whatever is valuable is in the text of it, you wind up um, in a very contorted sort of position. Uh, it, it, another way of putting this is that the medium of software is such that it violates certain unstated assumptions about the sort of thing copyrights are intended to protect. With the law being somewhat in turmoil, no lawyer can say to a company, you know, this is what the law is, you know, this is what your chances are. You have to give a client a somewhat ambiguous, uh, somewhat ambiguous direction. If you are in a position, and none of these companies are, where you are only subject to suit in Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Puerto Rico, I hope I haven't left anybody out, then go ahead and copy. If, on the other hand, you could be sued in the Tenth Circuit, or the Fifth Circuit, or the Ninth Circuit, or the Second Circuit, or any of the other places where the courts have taken different views, you have a problem. And since nobody, or at least nobody I know of, uh, has a business sufficiently confined that New England and Puerto Rico mark its boundaries uh, or the boundaries of effective jurisdiction over the, over the defendant. Uh, the answer is there isn't a legal rule and so people can't order their, their affairs. Those who would like to take advantage of freedom to copy can today without some risk because the Supreme Court didn't decide the case. It was getting to be a little bit like obscenity. I'll know it when I see it, uh, which is about the last thing that the business community wants to deal with.
because if they're going to invest some hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars developing a product and bringing it to market, generally they want to know, okay, what can I do and what can't I do? You go for everything you can get your hands on. And you say that the law is uncertain. Uh, and uh, the client is probably proceeding with his investment in light of, of a degree of uncertainty. Uh, but uh, you do go for copyright protection. You try and uh, make sure that you register all of the elements of a particular product or service as a trademark as well. And if there's something in there that's truly novel and non-obvious, then you go for some patent protection. So you'll go for all of those things. Uh, and then you'll, you know, you'll find your best tactic later on if someone tries to take off some of your user interface elements. Uncertainty is bad for our industry. Programmers have enough problems to deal with that legal uncertainty really hurts. I think the problem is that people need to know what the rules are. And uh, that doesn't mean that someone can, can come up with a single rule that will tell you automatically what the answer is in each case, because these cases tend to turn on their own facts. They are very fact specific. Uh, so uh, it's not that it will ever be that easy. But uh, the problem now is there is a real split between the circuits in terms of what the basic principles are that you apply. And the law in the First Circuit is quite out of sync with the rest of the country. So uh, the problem is that all of these companies are businesses that are at least national, if not international, in scope. So the problem presented is how do you decide? How do you make decisions? All of this has had very little direct effect on our clients or on software companies. companies seem the, the, the software industry moves so fast, standardization takes place uh, de facto so quickly uh, that it, the, the law seems to have had very little effect on the actions of software companies. The first decision against Lotus was considered absurd by some of the, the programmers. They basically ignore a lot of this stuff. Either they're not paying attention to it or they ignore it because they said, well, you know, you know, I can't pay attention. It's so the, the, the law cases are all over the place. It's better to ignore it or I don't believe in it because they come from schools where they didn't, that's not the way schools worked. We don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. We're a lot more worried about trade secrets than we are, um, you know, about Lotus Borland issues. It leads to a classic case of, of forum shopping, uh, controlling strategy, um, you know, for example, uh, let's assume that one of our clients uh, was threatened with suit by an out-of-state company for infringement. By uh, not only an out-of-state company, but a company outside of the First Circuit. We would immediately find local counsel outside of the First Circuit in the potential plaintiff state and bring an action for declaratory judgment or at least file it because we want the case to be outside of the First Circuit. The First Circuit has become a pariah. It's become a circuit to avoid at all costs in a case of this nature. The general trend in the law is against protection. And with the Supreme Court case as backdrop, my guess is we've seen the last menu case we're ever going to see. And graphical user interfaces uh, seem to have, have leapfrogged ahead of these cases, and the cases uh, cases like the Lotus Borland case no longer really are applicable. And I think that anyone knows that you don't copy precisely proprietary or, 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 or uh, original icons, for example, that are created by a company. Uh, that's just, just morally wrong. It's like copying art. Nobody needs to do that. But as far as the, as the basic structure of a user interface, Windows now determines that. So it's less of an issue. It seems clear that at some point, and maybe Lotus v. Borland may not be the best case to present for the copyrightability of user interfaces because the creativity in it was pretty trivial. But if you think of the creativity being Mickey Mouse basically being your guide uh, into the internet, you have something that I think probably most people would immediately intuit as copyrightable. Uh, and as a consequence, I think 
the next case that comes up where someone tries to rip some of the stuff off may be an easier case for the copyright rights holder. All the information that people are making available on the World Wide Web, is that now not copyrightable because when you point and click, you go off, you know, computers go off and do things. Um, is that now a method of operation not copyrightable? It's a global issue. I mean, our government has been marching around the world uh, pressuring our trading partners to provide strong effective copyright protection for computer software. And that was at the request of the U.S. software industry. This is one of the few industries where the United States still has a dominant position in the world. And uh, the reason is strong effective intellectual property protection. There are lots of people around the world who'd love nothing better than to be able to, to copy the creative efforts of America's best developers. If Lotus had been able to protect sort of like the spreadsheet metaphor completely, um, you would never have seen the wide distribution, I believe, of spreadsheets among people. You wouldn't have seen the competition. You wouldn't have seen the price come down. Had I gotten a patent on it, what would I have done with it? Exactly what we were doing with the copyrights and what everything else we could. We wouldn't have let anybody do a spreadsheet, you know, because we thought we liked the way we did it. And why would we want anybody else to do it? There would be no one, two, three. There would be no Excel because it's still been... Um, it's still, what, it's, we're just coming up on, uh, what is it, 17 years, okay? Well, we probably would have gotten in 80 or 81, 17 years. We're not there yet. I never supported the lawsuit. And, and I, the, my conflict was that because of residual loyalty and to people who were there and to the company that I started, and because it's not in my nature to like to kick up a fuss, believe it or not, uh, I felt really constrained from speaking out as strongly as I really felt about this for many years. The question then becomes, on this line of argument, if that's possible, what to do about it? And my point is that copyright is not well suited to prevent uh, or, or to deal with this problem because the period of protection is too long and, it, 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 and also because it protects the wrong thing. Trying to I mean, extend copyright to protect look and feel does in, in, incredible violence to the spirit of copyright doctrine. This is, this is from a legal point of view. I won't make that argument. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's been made a lot of places. So that led us to come to the conclusion that you needed a kind of a sui generis form of protection and that the, 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 um, the form of protection that we talked about in the in the law review article was one that would have, would essentially be a variant on unfair you know, competition law that would, would, would um, provide a limited period of protection against things like clones uh, in order uh, to make sure that there wasn't this disincentive created for, for creators. But it was a much narrower and more tailored form of protection. Call me old-fashioned or just stubborn, but I think Congress actually got it right. I think copyright is the right vehicle. I think that we are living through a period of uncertainty because the courts are struggling as they're trying to apply these traditional doctrines to new technologies, uh, which they don't perfectly understand yet and may never. Uh, but I think Congress when it picked copyright as the vehicle made a correct choice. It, it is, it strikes the right balance. Copyright law does not say you can't do it. Copyright law just says you can't copy. If you want to do it, you have to do it in your own words. In the case of menu command hierarchies, one could make a case that if you want protection over it, you should have to satisfy the rigorous requirements of a utility patent. And if you do that, you get 20 years' worth of protection. But under no circumstances should you get 100 years of protection through copyright law merely by filing a form in Washington and paying $20. If you create uh, unique collections of features that have behavior, those could be protectable, per se, uh, through some sort of, you know, registry, you know, registration of this is what we've done and we assert that it is, you know, original in the following form. 
uh, and it could give a limited amount of protection, like you know, we typically said you know, maybe three years. I think as long as the marketplace is competitive and there are a lot of user interfaces out there, that I think copyrights can be looked to, and I think appropriately so, and I think it'll be full copyright protection. To the extent that you get a dominant user interface, then I think people are going to offer some thin copyright protection and think a lot about fair use because they're going to want people to make somewhat transformative uses in order to compete uh, with a dominant user interface platform. I haven't heard anything yet that struck me as sort of the right thing. A lot of what I see is the wrong thing because I think by rushing in and trying to claim that a program, well, is just a literary work so we protect it the same way, or it's just a graphical work, or it's is clearly patentable or not. It just sort of, we, we sort of try, are trying to just use what we already have as opposed to really thinking about whether what we have is even applicable. And by sort of rushing um, without thinking into um, just applying our old traditional notions of copyright and patent, trade secret, what have you, you end up creating all sorts of side effects that you just never think about. Maybe it's taken a number of years, and maybe some people think that, uh, uh, that some of the decisions have been off the mark. But we are building a decision base uh, that is beginning to color the picture. See, the copyright lawyers, they have all these standard answers. They go, oh, yeah, but copyright's been extended to here and been extended to there. And that's all true, but that doesn't mean it's infinitely extensible. And the question is, where does it break? And is there something about software that breaks copyright in some important respects? Markets are very different. In some markets, you need the kind of monopoly that patent or copyright provides as an incentive to create. In other markets, you don't need that kind of incentive. And to provide it gives uh, an ironclad monopoly that's immutable and, and lasts, in the case of copyright, for a hundred years. So I think you have to evaluate, mar and this, our law's not set up to do this, but evaluate the type of market and then decide what you actually need to provide innovation in that type of market. The whole Lotus Borland case is, is, is really archaic. It's asking the court to decide a dispute based on, on on economic principles that existed in the early and mid-1980s. Uh, I think if a company, I mean, if a company wants to have a, a, a proprietary user interface, it should be allowed to do so. It, it should be the, the economics of the industry that determine whether it does or doesn't, not copyright law. The way it was resolved, it's as if cert was never granted, so this, the split between the circuits and among the circuits remains and will remain unless and until the Supreme Court takes another case uh, and hopefully Justice Stevens doesn't have to recuse himself and nobody else does and they have nine justices or seven justices but anything but eight uh, and they can actually come up with a decision. It's amusing to see how the courts wrestle with the problem of whether denying copyright to Lotus's menu would hinder innovation when you consider how far we've come in technological advancements despite denying Lotus protection. I understand where the courts were coming from. We've always considered copyright to be the legal protection which would serve to spur innovation. Yet there was and still is no guarantee that copyright will act as an appropriate incentive mechanism. In the technological age, this basic legal assumption no longer seems to apply. It's just remarkable how far off these basic legal assumptions can be when applied to computers. In fact, if Lotus had been granted a, an ownership right in its menu command hierarchy, not only would we never have had the more complex Quattro's program, but it's unlikely that we would have come anywhere near as far as we have in technological advancements. Even the commonplace program that I use to generate all of my new opinions based on my previous rationale and my input of ideological viewpoints probably wouldn't have been created. After all, the program simply draws upon programs that came before it, and it contains limited expression. Yet even now, almost 40 years later, there are no clear answers. The only congressional response was that computer command hierarchies can be copyrightable if they contain substantial expression. But that just gets us back to square one. Yes, it seems that the most difficult problem the courts faced was determining what exactly a menu command hierarchy is in the context of a computer program. 
But I think that we've made considerable advances by acknowledging that interoperability is a worthwhile goal of copyright law when applied to computers. I also think that by applying to the realm of copyright protection, some antitrust type analysis such as evaluating market shares and de facto standards, we have made copyright in the technological sphere more fine too to its practical effect of its particular marketplace. And because we have grown up with this technology and we're familiar with the way that computers work, I think that it's easier for us to adopt the law to the technology on a case by case basis. There's no doubt that we'll be faced with other obstacles and advances that may not fit comfortably into this new scheme, but I have no worries that we'll be able to adjust yet again. Well, shall we call it a day? I'm ready to sign off if you are.